This is an Audio Wool original. So basically, Mike, I I have read most of your book. Um, uh, it's actually a weird story. My mother-in-law is from Butte, and she knows I'm super interested in this stuff. And earlier this summer, she just brought this book to me. And she was like, have you read this? I saw this at the bookstore. And I was like, oh my God, I haven't. This is amazing. And so it was kind of a serendipitous thing. But I want to ask some questions, obviously, with the idea that most of our listeners have not read your book. So just kind of giving them a background. And one of the things I really like to do with some of the weird topics that I'm fascinated with is try and find people that don't necessarily represent the fringe, but represent a more scientific approach to these topics, which obviously is kind of the angle you're coming from. I think just the notion that you are a professor and this is something you've been able to study while also teaching at a university is kind of an interesting combination. So if you can just start out for us and give us a little bit of a background, were you always fascinated with UFOs and aliens and such things when you were a kid or was this an interest that came by way of some of your other research in grad school and beyond? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I was interested in ufos as a kid it wasn't an obsession and it it didn't even stem from any sort of uh interest in sci-fi or anything like that it's uh it was just because i overheard my father talking about a ufo encounter he had and uh my my ears kind of perked up because i didn't even know ufos were real so that sort of set the stage for what would become uh, a, a, a more real interest over time. And uh, as I describe in the first chapter of the book, he got Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, as most people did in the 1980s, especially ones who had a strange encounter. And uh, yeah, I just remember looking up and seeing that that quintessential alien form and pictured uh, an early hominin or chimpanzee-like form, a, a modern human in the middle, and then this alien on the right. And just kind of wonder if there could be a connection, if we're related to them somehow. And just the fact that they're so commonly reported with really human characteristics uh, made it seem like it was worth pursuing in uh, more, more detail, more depth. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for the listeners, can you give any details of your father's experience? Because I think that is really interesting as a formative moment for you. Well, I I had memories of hearing about it. I, I was I was supposed to be in bed. I was just creeping on the stairs and he was <laughs> dropping while he was telling the story to some uh, friends, adult friends that were over. Um, but yeah, it sounded like I, I did eventually interview him about it later when I was in college. Uh, and made notes and it, it was exactly how I remembered the story from when I was a kid. So uh, it kind of made me feel better about my long-term memory. Um, <laughs> but he, he described it as this, this ball of light that um, didn't really emanate light. It just glowed very brightly, um, which could be anything, obviously. But the fact that it was an Amish country in Northeast Ohio there's not a lot of lights in that area, so it's it's a very dark place. But it was very apparent that it wasn't something more conventional because it shot straight toward uh, his truck, and there was another person with him. He almost always rode alone on these late-night visits, but he just happened to have somebody with him, so there was another witness to this. Um, and then it stopped, I guess, right in front of the truck, uh, hovering up above them and out in front stayed there for a little bit and then shot back across the horizon to, I guess, finish mutilating a cow or whatever it was doing. Uh, stayed there for a little bit and then shot straight up into the sky at tremendous speed. So it's it's nothing too extraordinary. It's really pretty consistent with a lot of reports of, of that type of close encounter. But yeah, I guess it was sort of impactful in some way with regard to uh, my own curiosities and research later on one of the things that I found really interesting about your book is kind of these it's there are two different evolutions that I at least felt were being discussed. One is obviously the scientific evolution that with your background uh, and research, we're able to speak to really clearly about, you know, evolution of 
eyes and skull and all of those things. But then there was also discussion of this cultural evolution and even like with cartoon characters, the progression of eye to head ratio and how even in, in culture, there seems to be this trend moving towards what looks a lot more like, you know, the figure that we all imagine when we think of Whitley Strieber's cover. Did you, I guess, as a kid, and then further on when this became more of a, you know, a scientific interest to you beyond just a curiosity, were there any religious or cultural elements that complicated things for you or that came up in in discussions with your dad about his experience? Because I know a lot of people find some significant conflict between religious foundations and these interesting events that occur. Yeah, that's a great question and something that I don't think really gets talked about enough, um, to be honest, because it it is a roadblock for a lot of people. Many have hangups because of their faith when anything about UFOs or aliens is mentioned. I actually just saw an article two weeks ago. Um, It's usually sitting right here on my desk. And it's always in the way. And then, of course, <laughs> one time I wanted to reference it. I can't find it. But it uh, it basically just said that um, highly religious people have a low level of belief in uh, the UFO phenomenon, extraterrestrials, that whole thing. And, and it makes sense because, yeah, I was raised in a fundamentalist Christian home, you know, going to church and Sunday school and all that. Yeah, it's it's interesting because most of the hang up is because christians specifically there's obviously other faiths as well but christians believe in one creation of man here on earth so obviously other creations and other planets challenges that world view however uh i'm fond of pointing out that this particular model this time travel extratempestrial model still is consistent with that belief system. Um, Really, Christians should love this particular way of explaining it because it's still talking about this creation. If you believe that we were created by a deity, um, it's the same one. It's just a future period in in human time. So it it doesn't involve a, a separate creation on another planet. But uh, that was a pretty recent revelation. In fact, um, it just kind of came into my mind in the last few months or so. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but if you if you do think about it in the context of extraterrestrials, yeah, it's hard to circle that square if you are a person of faith and have a very strong faith and um, it's not something you want to think about because it challenges that ideology. But um, yeah, as far as my own personal experience, I was pretty religious for a while. Uh, my father, who saw the UFO, was and I assume still is very religious but yeah when I interviewed him about it in college it was it, it was the the same thing you would say about dinosaur bones and everything else that it's it's the devil trying to lead you away from god I think is what he said right. so yeah so it was hard to really like have a a, a full on conversation about it cuz it was that you know if that's where you're coming from <laughs> can't really dive too deep right. into anything because the devil is just trying to get you to think about this to lead right. you into a pit of hell, I guess. So, yeah, yeah. It, obviously that was a big hang up for him. It wasn't for me as much because I, I don't, you know, subscribe to that sort of extremist ideology. Um, so I was able to kind of move past it and continue to research that and evolution and other things that will get me condemned to hell, I guess. <laughs> You and me both. <laughs> yeah, I it's it is interesting to me because I have heard more and more of that narrative surrounding okay, the aliens, if they exist in the UFOs, they are demons, they are evil creatures. And um yeah. I hadn't heard that until a couple of years ago, and I guess probably just reading in different circles, but um I guess for you, not just with this topic, but with science in general, clearly that is the direction you went in in college and beyond and now as a professor. So how did that transition happen for you that even opened the door to being able to investigate this topic from that perspective? I mean, that's a pretty dramatic change. 16 years old, I have a PhD in hard sciences. Right. Well, it actually started with the way it, 
finished well, i guess i'm not dead so the way it's going <laughs> now currently <laughs> as a living person who's still researching these things but it started with evolution i i'd always i'd, I'd always got national geographic magazines as a kid i was always super interested in science and like uh the titanic and popular mechanics it was way over my head but i enjoyed reading those types of things but then i remember in high school my freshman year i got the only two books in our library our high school library about evolution and they were horrible they're basically picture books with like cheesy cartoon drawings and Looking back on it, it's sort of disgraceful, and it's probably actually the status quo for many high schools throughout the nation. Yeah. But it was enough to sort of quench that thirst a little bit and uh, keep my interest in it going. This was all obviously before the internet. Um, but then I got to college and started out in physics and astronomy and then switched to biological anthropology once I realized that was a thing that existed. And it seemed not only way more interesting, but also a good way of approaching this question of whether or not they could be us from the future. So it, it yeah, I, I'm glad I made that choice. It's allowed me to travel all over the world and, and do digs and research in museums and universities and just really get an in-depth knowledge of this thing that I've been interested in since I was a young child. So it's so interesting because, yeah, I was raised not religious at all. And I often joke with my husband and Byron friends that, you know, this type of stuff has become, I guess, the closest thing to my agnostic pursuits, as you could imagine, because I, I don't subscribe to any of the traditional religious beliefs, but I feel like there's got to be something beyond what we have. And for years, you know, obviously it was not a novel thought, but for years I have always said, what if it's just us? You know, it looks enough like us and why else would they be interested in us? Because one of the huge arguments to hear people who really just dis discount, you know, aliens or UFO sightings representing any type of otherworldly interaction is why would they care about us? Why would some super advanced civilization care about us? And, you know, the obvious answer is, well, if it is us, then they yeah. care about us and quite a bit. Why would why would they care about the earth? It's always take care of the earth, take care of the environment, don't nuke each other. Why would they care right. unless they were stakeholders in the future of this planet? If if we share the same planet and they right. get it next and we're mucking it all up, you could see why they would want to intervene. And um, it, it's a weird way of going about it, admittedly, telling school kids in Zimbabwe right. or you exactly. know, random people yeah. they pick up, like go, go smack putin in the face and say hey stop making nukes or you know right. like go right. talk to someone who can actually enact change but there's also that would seem to be in conflict with their sort of prime directive not of non-interference because they do seemingly go out of their way to pick people up in very remote places drop them off with foggy memories missing time screen memories and and really right. try not to be uh, seen or, or recognized or really interject themselves too much. So maybe that's the best they can do. Maybe it's all they're allowed to do is tell some school kids, hey, take care of this planet. I don't, I don't know. Right. We've got some limitations. So, so for those of us that do not have super high specialized backgrounds in um, physics and space time and an understanding of how time travel would even function, I think most of us probably go, okay, what happened in Back to the Future? And he went back and there was this, you know, tangential timeline that shot up because something changed. So yeah. in in super like layman's terms, can you give us just a little bit of an explanation for how this works theoretically for us in the future to come back and have some type of interaction without completely throwing things off kilter? Right. Well, first, I'd like to point out that Marty McFly ruined the brains of an entire generation. I uh, know. But it was just, it's, <laughs> it's the, the, that's our only reference for any sort of, yeah. and there were other ones. There was like Time Cop and some other ones. But for some reason, I, I guess it was the most popular movie. So it just sticks with people. But yeah, it's, that's not how it works at all. Uh, you're not out there playing guitar and you start disappearing and you, disappear from picture no that's that's dumb. right right yeah um basically there's there's a couple different ways of looking at it 
um, it really comes down to whether you subscribe to the, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, the multiverse, essentially, where you can have these alternate timelines. And the idea there is that if you go back into the past, you create this quantum decoherence where you have a new timeline form uh, that is different from the one that you came from, obviously. So within that context, you do have these paradoxes that arise, like the consistency paradox, and uh, such as the grandfather paradox. What happens if you go back in time and kill your grandfather before they had your mother or father, whichever one right. it may be? But those don't exist in the context of block time. Um, and that's that's the most dominant model in physics. It's the one I used to write this book. Um, an important tenet of that is the Navakov self-consistency principle uh, popularized by Igor Nav Navakov. It became his namesake, a Russian physicist who's very well known and respected. Um, and, and in this context, it's a little bit different because in block time, the basic idea to boil it down is that all moments you can kind of think about as all time and space, which we know are linked um, intricately, Minkowski space time and what Einstein showed with relativity. Every right. moment from the beginning of the Big Bang to the last bits of matter in the universe um, are, are all one massive block of four dimensional space time. You can kind of think of it as being timeless or everything happens at the same time. Uh, it's really just a matter of perspective at that point. But within this block time, you can't change anything. You don't have to worry about these consistency paradoxes because you, if, if your grandfather was alive and your parents were alive and you were alive, there's no way to, to go back in time and kill said individual. Um, anything you do in the past is innately non-disruptive. There's an inherent self-consistency there because anything you are going to do, even if you feel you have this sense of free will that you're going to buck this trend and you're going to go back and you're going to change something right anything you do has already manifested itself before you ever went back to do it you're just doing what you'd always done in that moment and any yeah. effect of that has already rippled through to the point where you go back to do it in the first place so everything remains self-consistent in the block universe model the landscape time model um, so you don't really have to worry about those paradoxes as much uh, with regard to the physical way of doing it, it's going to be a while. I, I make some arguments in the book about how we've come to understand how we could create closed time light curves, how we could move locally into the future, but into the global past based on solutions to Einstein's field equations since he published his paper on general relativity in 1915. Um, but really we're not going to know exactly how to do it or be able to do it until we understand this fundamental aspect of nature um, that time and likely gravity come from possibly even space uh, that are thought to um, be emergent an emergent phenomenon where there's something else that's fundamental that they stem from uh, but until we understand what that is and until we can have a, a unified theory of quantum mechanics and general relativity we're just not going to be able to do that uh but it could be right around the corner who knows we could be closer than we think well and i think you know the, all the interesting things that i probably understand five percent of when i read the articles but so much happening with quantum computing and quantum mechanics and i feel like the the speed at which we're evolving our understanding of those things has to be moving towards a better understanding of like you said, where all of these different, at least the way we experience these different dimensions where that emerges from. But Absolutely. I, I do think it's interesting that, you know, in popular culture, you hear the multiverse theory talked about constantly. I mean, I feel like that's referenced in pop culture all over the place and the many worlds, but the block time or the landscape time model is, at least in my experience, a lot more rare in terms of popular discussion. It, do you, why do you think that is? Because to me, it, it makes so much sense. Do you think it's just mankind's inherent aversion to believing that free will may not exist? Yeah, or... that, that's, <laughs> that, I literally had this conversation two hours ago with my wife. Yeah, we, we have this undying love for free will. And in the block universe, free will as we understand it and as we want it to exist doesn't. 
And that really right. bothers people. And it, yeah, I, I really think the multiverse and, and my wife's the one that said this, we we're in agreement is, is a way to, for people to still have their free will and eat it too. They, right. they just want that to be reality. And this allows that you can, make changes you can alter things and, and there's been some interesting examples in pop culture it's the block universe model has been brought in more recently but what i've noticed is that at the end of all of these shows even though everything adheres to self-consistency throughout they'll still in my opinion <laughs> screw up the entire show right at the yeah. end by being like, oh no, wait, we can change something. There is free. right. A great example is the show Dark, a really great show yes. out of Germany. Oh my God, it's incredible. It's so good. The first, well, the first two seasons were good. Yeah. And then, because yeah. everything was, they, they must have had consultants who were physicists, because it was so well done in this beautiful storyline with self consistent events throughout. And then season three comes and they try to get into the multiverse and it was just this totally, yeah. I, I don't know what your FCC rules are here. So I'll try to keep this clean. Oh no, go to town. You're fine. You're totally fine. A complete fine. <laughs> goat fuck of a storyline that just <laughs> yeah. lost all meaning. It lost all coherence. And, and I was telling everybody about this show. I'm like, oh, it's such a great yeah. show. Finally, somebody's doing it in a way that makes sense. And then season three comes. Uh, another one is Devs with uh, Nick Offerman. We were just talking about Devs a moment ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's it's newer. People probably haven't seen it as much, so I won't give anything away. By this point, if you haven't watched Dark, then it's that's yeah, on you. I'll bad. give you spoilers exactly. on that one. Yeah. But yeah. with Devs, no, it's a uh, it's it's really great show, and and it again comes down to this block universe versus the multiverse and. It's it's still an interesting storyline, but it yeah it, it who yeah knows? it raises some well, it, questions. But most most physicists do adhere to the block universe model. So give me like if we were to say okay, this is the best easily accessible model of block universe accurately or block time accurately represented. First two seasons of Dark, great. But are there any other? I mean, for people to look to to say okay, this is more aligned with the general scientific belief. Any other spots that you would say, yeah, this this does a pretty good job of representing it? Uh, not that I can think of. Okay. Because you're right. Like like you said, I, they almost all go to that that multiverse, the what if. What, we, what if we change this? Right. What's going to happen? The, blo the butterfly effect, the Mandela effect, all of these things right. that are arguably more interesting. Right. Maybe people find it boring when they adhere to self-consistent events or I, I, I find it much easier to follow, but maybe it's not as easy to follow for people or yeah, they get too much hate mail or too <laughs> much disagreement in their focus groups because everybody wants free will in the storyline. So I, unfortunately, I, I can't think of any and yeah. I, I, I love time travel movies, so I'm always looking for them and people are always recommending them to me. So I don't know. Maybe Devs and Dark are the only ones. Right. It's, I, I would. I doubt it. But those uh, are the only two okay. I'm aware of. Yeah, it is really, really fascinating. And I think the free will concept. We've actually talked about that at length before too on our show. Just, I mean, I am a full blown subscriber to the idea that I have no free will whatsoever. And, and that's it's fine. Weird. Yeah, and and it's very weird how reactive people are when I have that conversation with them. That in a way, it's like. I don't know. It, it, I feel like that must be something like what really religious people feel when they like let go of everything and say, you know, it's on God and he's going to figure things out. That's how I feel when I, you know, okay, yeah, there is no free will. Whatever I'm going to do has probably already been set. And I may think that I'm making a choice, but really the choice I'm making is just the consequence of an infinite number of variables leading, leading up to that point. And I didn't have control over the source point, so I don't have control over this. Yeah. But and people freak out they do they do i get a lot of hate mail about that and and bigfoot they also don't like my views on bigfoot oh um, let's hear bigfoot i got no 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 i can only get so much hate mail <laughs> at, at, in one in one interview um but no i was gonna say that you know we still feel like we're making decisions it's not and, and it's the dumbest argument that i always hear is well if we don't have free will then we just go out and murder 
people and, and do whatever we want. No, that's idiotic. That is a stupid argument because right. there's still consequences for your actions, whether you yeah. feel that you are deciding or it's just a byproduct of our consciousness and how we move through space time. It, it, it doesn't matter. I, I just posted this uh, really great video, a short video on my, um, my Facebook page, not my personal one, but like my book page uh, by this a German woman, I'm assuming she's German from her accent. I think she's a physicist, but it's called, you don't have free will, but don't worry. And it lays out beautifully all of the arguments for why free will just doesn't exist in the way that we understand the universe and space time and neuroscience and stimulus and response and all of these different things. And I, I'd encourage people to to go find that. You can just Google it. You don't have free oh, will, I'm, but don't worry. It's worth it's worth a watch. That sounds phenomenal. I'm probably gonna have to send it to all my family and friends because it is really rare that I get anybody to buy into my perspective. I swear it's so much less stressful once you arrive at it. It's it's it is very yeah. freeing. You're just you know you're kind of riding in the back of the Uber instead of trying to drive through rush hour traffic on the 405 in Los Angeles. You can just kind of exactly. cruise. It takes, takes a lot of the stress out of life. It takes the anxiety out. If, if you, I mean, you can still have ups and downs, obviously, but I feel like it smooths those out to some extent somehow. It has for me dramatically. So, okay, see, now, Byron, I have actual scientific you know, verification for why my perspective is far better than yours about free will. Okay. Um, <laughs> obviously, I'm sure you talked about this a lot at the McMenamin's conference. We hunted around a bit to see if we could find a video of it because I was hoping to watch it before we chatted with you today. But I would imagine given this year and everything that happened, you know, this spring and summer with the Pentagon report or the preliminary report, at least, and you know, hopefully a little bit of the evolution in terms of stigma associated with some of these things. It feels like it's eking into the mainstream a little bit more. What are your thoughts about the information that was released in that mini report and how that ties into the research that you've done? And I know you're you're working on an book and you post about it quite a bit. I don't know when it's coming out or what the exact subject matter is, but hoping that it ties into all of this too. Right. Well, I'd like to point out too that I, I think that uh, UAP TF report did actually have an effect. Uh, it didn't really say anything, but it, right. I think it, it all of the mainstream press coverage leading up to it was hugely impactful in the sense that it did show people, hey, this is real. They have been investigating this for a long time. Uh, the Pentagon confirmed the validity of the Fleer, Gimbal, and GoFast videos from 2004, 2014, 2015. So it's it's a real phenomenon now. That's a damn good starting point for moving forward with an even more informed conversation about this. And, and I saw it at the McMinimans UFO Fest. I, I was asked to do a TV interview for um, the CBS news station out of Portland a couple days before my talk. COIN, I think, K-O-I-N was oh. the station. They asked that question, like, do you think there'll be more people or different people because of the the Pentagon report and other things that have been happening? And I said, well, I hope so, because this is something that if people weren't allowing themselves to be interested in or talk about with other people, whether you've had an experience or you're just curious about it, now you can be. The stigma's waning. Uh, come right. hear some talks. Come have some conversations. And I met a ton of people after my talk who were that exact person who had always kind of been interested, but felt shame, especially, you know, you tell your family, hey, I'm going to a UFO conference <laughs> and, yeah. and they're like, wait, yeah. what? You've never said anything about UFOs. Well, now you can. Right. You know, now it's right. okay to talk about and to, you know, drive an hour South of Portland to go see some people have real discussions about it. So I, I think it, it was impactful in that respect. As far as my research, I didn't say anything about time travel. I didn't say anything about space travel either. I didn't say anything about aliens or beings. It was just the, the main right. takeaway was it's a threat, which is bullshit. It's not a threat. If they yeah. wanted to hurt us, they could have hurt us at any yeah. point throughout the That's... hundreds or thousands of years that they've been here. But it, it's clickbait. They get, yeah. they get more attention. They can get more money. 
uh, if they say there's a threat. Yeah. But it was also that they they said there are cases that have no explanation. Yeah, obviously, that's what Project Blue Book said too. But saying right. it now, after those videos have been confirmed, I think does carry a little bit more weight and does allow us to continue to move the conversation forward. So even though it didn't really say anything of worth, it, it was still hugely important for the overall zeitgeist that surrounds the UFO question. Well, and that's good to hear that you felt like it carried over to a conference like McMenamin's because, I mean, don't get me wrong, I've been into this stuff for most of my life, but I also try to live a, a fairly normal existence, pretty much a normie outside of what I do with this. And it is an interesting duality to try and keep between, wow, I'm really interested in thinking about this. But when, when you bring this stuff up, people look at you like you're crazy. And then suddenly this spring, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, tons of people were calling me, emailing, Kelly, did you see this? This is so cool. Because they knew I was like the one weirdo friend that everybody has that's always loved this stuff. And now it's kind of normal to talk about it. It's all right. So I'm yeah. glad that that was showing up in kind of the population that or you know attended that conference that's great to hear yeah it was great um, to see that some sort of tangible outcome you know because yeah. we can all say oh well people should be more interested or we can talk about it now but yeah to to actually meet people who came there that otherwise wouldn't have i, I felt like that was really important that's great yeah well and i think your presence there too because again you you do not represent you know the wingnut faction of Speaking of Bigfoot, but Bigfoot's being beamed down from UFOs and, you know, yeah, the, well, the not yet. Team. Give it time. You know, I've, <laughs> I've still got some aspirations to, uh, to grow my hair out real long and get real. Spindly. You know what? And, we need to get you in a room with Jeff Meldrum and you guys can talk about Bigfoot. That's what needs to happen. <laughs> the, I, that's like the one guy that I would imagine you having some type of a fruitful Bigfoot discussion with as the, yeah. the Bigfoot doubter. I don't yeah. think he would like my views either, but <laughs> I don't know. He's not very far. I, he's in Idaho, right? And um, he is. He is. Is it uh, Pocatello? Is it that one or the one it in Boise? Is. It's the one in Pocatello. Yeah. Oh yeah, and that's he, like two I mean, hours away. You should really make the trip. I have to tell you, I had a long conversation with him a couple years ago. Really nice guy. I actually ran into him at a gas station in Deer Lodge of all places. Oh, we were driving weird. back from Fairmont and I was actually reading his book in the car. My husband went huh. in to get something from the gas station and out walks this guy. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's Jeff Meldrum. That's and we had this so great random. chat. And it was very random. It was, I mean, I joke that that's like my moment where, okay, simulation theory almost has mm -hmm. to be real with that yeah. type of a weird. Yeah. But, city. Yeah. Yeah. Very strange. You know, but, I've always, I, it must have been cool for him too, because I've always thought, you know, flying around or whatever, how fun would it be if I just walked by somebody reading my book? And, and oh my God. he yeah. had that moment because you were reading yeah. his book as, yeah. you know, he happened to be spotted. That's that's cool that you had that it, encounter. It was cool. It was, and I think you guys would actually get along. He's Because he's not a believer. He's an investigator. I and mean, he's very much like, I think if there's enough data that it's worth looking into. He doesn't live and breathe the idea that Bigfoot's real and out there. But uh, it'd be okay. cool to hear you yeah. guys. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe yeah. uh, maybe you'll try a little harder than to get in touch yeah you should i mean i'm telling you i think it'd be a great conversation um so one of the things that i see you talk about a little bit in the book and i'd like to hear your thoughts on too i think when i start thinking about some of the less believable or at least more difficult for me as a normie to swallow perspectives on ufo experiences or ifo experiences are the abduction experiences. And I'm sure you've spoken to a lot of people over the years who have had those encounters. And I'd love to hear your perspective on, I guess, similarities between those that you've picked up on that may speak to some of the intentions behind perhaps our future selves with coming back and scaring the hell out of their ancestors. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that that is actually in a nutshell uh, everything you just said is the next book. That's that's what it's about. Awesome. In the first one, I, I mostly just looked at long-term trends and human evolution, both cultural and biological, and then sort of assessed the extraterrestrial hypothesis in the context of astrobiology and astronomy 
and physics, but there wasn't much mention of the contactee experience at all. Uh, in fact, I hadn't even heard of Jim Penniston until about two months before the book came out. And I was like, whoa, this is very corroborating. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I chucked it in right at the end, you know, just a, about two paragraphs, I think, in the context of something I'd already written about genetic homogenization and some potential problems we might face with an increase in homozygous recessive traits and, and diseases and disorders and things just based on, on past and current trends. But other than that, there wasn't a lot of mention of contact experiences. So this book, even though it's arguably a more tenuous aspect of the argument, we have video evidence now that the craft are real um, that can't really be debunked or, or attributed to something right. else. But obviously, we don't have videos of people being abducted or the big-headed, big-eyed, small-faced, childlike aliens running around underneath these craft. That doesn't exist yet. So what we can go by uh, are the descriptions provided by people who have had these experiences. And obviously, you know, those things can be confused for something else too, sleep paralysis or some other sort of... Uh, thing, an event, or possibly a mental issue, schizophrenia, or anything like that. But it's it's not likely that they can all be explained by anything like that. It's just way too common. It happens throughout the world. It's happened for really hundreds of years, uh, documented cases, and probably thousands. I mean, if I had access to this technology, I'd go back as far as I absolutely could and try to learn as much about our hominin ancestors from living tissues and living individuals uh, as far back as my technology would let me. So yeah, I, I focus more on those. I look at uh, actually a couple Montana cases that Joan Bird mentioned in her book, Montana UFOs. I, I feel that those are worth investigating the context of this time travel model because really they just scream time travel to me and it's not something that she examined. In her book, so I sort of re-examine those cases and look at uh, some of the original documents for what um, what what these contactees describe seeing and their experiences. But in the context of this extra tempestrial model, yeah, I look at twenty cases overall that span nearly a hundred years in time from all over the world, and to sort of break wow. them down, like what do they fit with this time travel model? Where do they not fit? Uh, what about the interdimensional, the ultra terrestrial, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the simulation hypothesis? How, how do these cases and what's being described fit? But then also to your original question, what do these consistencies demonstrate? Because all we have to go by is the physical descriptions of the craft, the beings, their behaviors. And if we look at all of that, there's a lot of indications that they are simply us from the future and they're doing things that are seemingly self-serving that help them. It's not that they're trying to help us or change us or interfere with us, but it's seemingly things that uh, they do because of some reason they have for doing these things. Right. Yeah. And, and in the same way, we don't understand how they're traveling backwards. We don't understand what those reasons are either, but were you able to speak with any of these contactees or have you thus far in the research you're doing? I think it'd be interesting to hear what their reaction is to this possibility that maybe it's not something to be quite as terrified of because it's just us. Yeah, no, that's, it's funny you put it that way too. Cause um, a, a friend of mine, uh, Ellis Martin is his name and I can use his name cause he uh, had me on his show. He's, he actually is in the financial world and my interview is the only one he's ever done that deviated from that. Because oh, he's usually bringing on stock traders and commodities investors <laughs> and stuff. And so he had me on. But then he tells this jaw-dropping story about all of these uh, abductions he had throughout his childhood. And, and I remember we're sitting on the beach in Malibu. And he was like, yeah, I asked my mom. You know, when I got older, I was like, Mom, what was up with all the enemas when I was a kid? And she's like, what? what? Oh, God. What are you talking about? He's like, yeah, like, what was, what was with the weird butt stuff? Like, the night and the, the weird doctors and the lights and stuff? And she's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, my God. So he was subjected to all of these anal probes 
really throughout his his childhood and he he actually um contributed uh, uh this story he told his story and uh wrote it all out and sent it to me and gave me permission to publish it so i attached it as an addendum because i introduced the, the anal probe aspect in the context of whitley streber's encounter because he endured that as do most uh, abductees right. um but yeah one thing that really stood out when we were talking about this in malibu was that he said you know when i read your book i suddenly felt much more okay with what happened to me because the, right. the idea in my mind that these creatures from another planet were coming here and they were doing all of these things it just it disgusted me i felt violated but when i started thinking about it in the context of this theory that they're just us doctors from the future essentially doing these biomedical examinations i was i was suddenly okay with it it made me right. think you know it, it was weird it was uncomfortable but yeah, all right, I guess it's just us, that's fine. So it really right. changed his perception of his own experiences. And I've, I've heard that from other people as well. And and looking forward too, a, a buddy of mine said he his entire childhood, he was afraid of UFO uh, invasions, that they're gonna come down and uh, kill us all. And it was a real fear he had. And then he read the book and he became convinced that the most likely explanation is that they're us. And he said that, you know, suddenly all those fears went away. Why would, why would our descendants who rely on the continued survival of our species come back and, and murder all of us and take our resources? Right. So, yeah, I right. think the idea is, has kind of sat well with people, um, not just because it's seemingly more logical of an explanation, but it does help explain some of those behaviors. And it's, it's a little easier to, to, to have acceptance, I think, of, of that idea as opposed to uh, an extraterrestrial origin. Yeah, man, I'd love to hear, John Mack, we're still around, I'd love to hear what and, uh, he would say about such a, such a spin on it with all the people he spoke to. Have yeah. you been able to speak with Whitley at all? Has that ever been something that you've been able to, in the at least work for this second book? Yeah, actually, it was sort of a, very full circle moment um but he invited me on his show sometime last year maybe last summer i think it was 2020 and um yeah you know i i, I get on the, the <laughs> interview with him and it was it was just this very surreal moment and wow of course he asked me about my origin story so i'm telling him about my origin which he already knew because he'd read right. the, book. the book but yeah. of course i get to the part where and then i looked up on the bookshelf and i saw this book i, I don't know if you're familiar with it it wasn't very well read oh, it wasn't very popular no but it was, it was uh, it's my origin story too which is funny my parents had that oh no book kidding and yeah and it's my dad is an artist and it sat on his desk in his art studio and I'd get up in the middle of the night with nightmares and I'd see this book there. And I like, that was my first. And then for years I had nightmares of that alien face at my window. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally uh, where that's it comes funny. from for me. It was the yeah. opposite for me. It was this moment of awakening and yeah, yeah just deep see, interest. You knew it, was it, was it was never scary. Along. Yeah. You, you knew this in, you know, instinctually. Yeah, I was eight. I was eight yeah, there you go. the idea crossed my mind. I actually, I'm looking at it right now. It was so impactful that I took that book from my father. Don't tell him. I don't know if he knows I have it. And I took the cover off and framed it and put it up on my bookshelf facing out. Okay, that's awesome. Just like it was when I was a kid. It's uh It gives me a great idea. I may have to go on a recon mission at my parents' house sometimes. <laughs> that's a great idea. <laughs> Yeah, just go uh, dive in through some old boxes and yeah, you know, find I don't know. It, I'm pretty but... sure I know where it is. That's so cool. But, but to actually, be able to tell him, like this is yeah, yeah, your, yeah, it was super cool. And then off. and then we just had a, a great conversation. He even invited me back for his like members only part, where he usually talks about oh, wow. something by himself. But it was like you know, it, it, you want to come along for that journey too? I'm like, hell yeah, let's dive deep into near oh, death wow. experiences and consciousness and past lives, and just had a oh, fantastic wow. conversation. He's great. Uh, we were on a panel together for Contact in the Desert just uh, a couple months ago as well. Um, yeah. We told this this great story at the end right before he signed off is a total mic drop moment where he's talking about a, f a friend who had also seen these beans 
I think while visiting him and his his wife uh, Anne up at their cabin in New York, he was saying this woman's freaking out and she's scared and she's screaming and the beans look at her and say, why are you screaming? Why are you so afraid? And she said, because you're so ugly and scary. And he, and he goes, and he goes, and then it just looked at her and said, someday, ma'am, you'll look exactly like us. And then he just disappeared. Like he logged off. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. <laughs> it was like Whitley out, but it was like, <laughs> it was a total time travel tell. You know, like oh, someday wow. you will look just like us. And then he just drops the mic and signs out of Zoom. <laughs> it was that hilarious. is amazing. Yeah, oh. total, total boss move. I love that guy. He's yep. great. Yeah, that is so cool. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I'm really excited. Do you have any guesstimates on when your next book will be out? I'm really looking forward to reading that. Yeah, well, unfortunately, I'm relying on other people uh, yeah. for help with that um i had three reviewers uh who i gave the book to coming up on two months ago now what? and yeah yeah they were really? like oh yeah give me a couple weeks uh two of them are in los angeles i was down there a, f a few weeks ago uh actually i think a month ago and i met up with them just to kick them in the ass and say hey so are we doing this because i'd kind of like to keep working on this book took them out for some dinner and you know we talked about it they're like yeah just give me a hard deadline I'll get it back to you okay so i'm supposed to get it back this week we'll see if that happens um but if it, i it is pretty far along like what i gave them i felt like was a, a draft that was close i had already rewritten okay. it four times up leading up to that <laughs> point so usually wow. I, usually i do five to eight edits um so i might still and i count reading the the audio book as one of those edits that's really the final edit because you catch so much more when you speak yeah words out loud. absolutely so i'll probably do one or two more revisions when i get their comments back um i, I don't know why i'm giving you all of this detail that no this matter. is great <laughs> it's, it's actually I, very helpful <laughs> it's a process uh a lot of people aren't aware of just how insane the editing part of the process is but then no. you know there's the formatting there's the indexing and there's the recording of the audiobook which always sucks oh, but anyway brutal yeah anyway it, no. and i i'm looking at early 2022 so hopefully within okay. the next six months or so fantastic well I, I am certainly not a reviewer with any clout but i'm damn good at editing if you your set of I might keep that in um, mind because yeah. I mean if I if I find out this week that they still haven't done anything um see this is this is why you can't pay people in wild game sausage because it's just <laughs> there's no contracts well, there you know they love the sausage they love the elk meat they can't get it yeah. in Los Angeles well, so but you also don't have that contract with the hard deadline on it yeah, and see, I hate wild game meat personally, and I just like UFO materials, so the incentive is in the reading, so it works much that better. Could, that could work out. Like me. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. No. Something yeah, I mean, about. in my in my normal life, like my real like that, I'm able to meld a little bit more these days because there's less stigma. Um, I actually do like editing and college admissions work with kids, so that's oh, cool. like my. That's actually. That's my jam. So yeah, but that's really, really impactful I, too, because a lot of kids really need that. Yeah, it's we send a lot of kids to Butte. You'd be surprised. I'm always telling kids that's if you're going to stay in school, state, yeah, it's the best ROI for in state. Montana for Tech sure. is a fantastic really is. university. I, I do wonder how the hell with all of these adventures you've had, you ended up in Butte, Montana. Though that is fascinating to me. Well, what's even more fascinating, which I didn't even learn until I moved here, is that my great grandfather and great uncle worked in the mines in Butte. What? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Moved out here. Wow. My mom said something to my grandma, who was really toward the end of her life. She had Alzheimer's bad, but she was like, Oh, Butte. I, I lived in Butte for a while. And she's like, What? what? Yeah. <laughs> but, but I guess, yeah, my great uncle's still buried out here somewhere. My great grandfather wow. obviously went back to Ohio and uh, made 
the rest of us. But yeah, they worked in the mines here in the early 1900s. So it was, I guess it was always meant to be. I guess so. Yeah. Well, and Montana is a good place to be. I mean, maybe book three needs to be the uh, nuclear interference. I always feel like somebody needs to do a bigger deep dive into the incident in Great Falls back in the 60s. I think that's so fascinating. And yeah. Again, I think ties really closely to this time travel idea. I mean, perfectly good reason for them to come back and say, please do not blow us up. Please, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, don't, don't irradiate this planet for thousands of years to come. Yeah, yeah. Really uh, book, three, book three is actually the mutes, though. It's already in, in the really? works. Yeah, the no mutilations are a fascinating <gasps> aspect of the phenomenon. And, working with somebody in Canada to develop a large database of uh, not, not, they can't even just say cattle mutilations because they mutilate. There, there's a group of, s- of yeah. sea lions actually. No, yes, yeah, sea lions across uh, like the Canadian Pacific coast recently. There's the string no of way. Like 13 to 15 horses in France recently. It's, it's a lot of different animals. Oh my God. Well, um, yeah, please keep us posted. I would love to have you back on with the second book. And if you need any research grunts or editors really do throw us an email. Right. We'd love to help in any way. You're doing awesome yeah, stuff. And that. it's just great to hear somebody in the world of academia actually discussing this with some rational perspective. And <laughs> um, hopefully you don't catch too much shit for it because it's, it's doing great work out there, I think. Oh, I appreciate that. And, and yeah, it's been a very positive response from my colleagues and my institution. Good. So I'm excited about that. That is good. That's great to hear. Mike, thank you so much for your time. I know you got to go put kids to bed. I got to do the same, but hopefully we can talk again soon and can't wait to see your next yeah awesome thanks for having me on it was uh it's great chatting thank you so much yeah great talking to you have a good one all right you too take care you've been listening to an audio wall original produced by byron mccoy Theme music provided by Cemeteries. For more programs like this, visit audiowool.co.